First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Carolyn and Janet for the invitation uh, to talk and also uh, the APS and Physiological Society for putting on uh, the symposium. So my task uh, today is to really try and focus on um, physical inactivity in the context of aging, and I'm mainly going to dwell upon uh, muscle metabolic health. By that, I mean uh, protein metabolism and uh, usually uh, tissue glucose uptake. So uh, the first qualifying point I want to make is that um, sarcopenia is not simply uh, the loss of muscle mass. It is also the loss of muscle quality. And there are many different ways to measure uh, muscle quality, but uh, people tend to forget about uh, the importance of the quality of muscle that re remains with aging. If we look firstly at mass loss, um, this is a classic study um, that demonstrates uh, total body potassium in the context of aging in males and females. And you see with time and with age, there's clearly a decrease in total body potassium. The mechanisms, oh, sorry, the uh, parallel with that, you get a reduction in strength with aging because we do know that there is a relationship between uh, strength and uh, muscle mass, and there's also a relationship with power. But in this uh, paper uh, by uh, Frontera and Meredith, you see that uh, in the elderly people, there is a loss of uh, strength when it's expressed as a percentage of the young, and it declines to a level that actually does limit uh, daily physical activity capability. So this is the range of strength needed to uh, get out of a chair without using your arms. Why is it important? Because it's now emerging from several studies, this is uh, just one of them, that there is a relationship between muscle mass and all-cause mortality. Um, this is just one of the recent papers uh, demonstrating that. Thinking of the mechanistic basis, um, the first real inroads to this, and I haven't really seen any data that are better than this, are the data uh, published by Mike Rennie, demonstrating that uh, if you increase the, oh, sorry, if you increase the infusion rate of essential amino acids, and you measure myofibrillar protein uh, synthesis rate and sarcoplasmic protein synthesis rate in muscles of young <clears throat> and elderly volunteers, you see this, what has been defined as anabolic blunting occurring, which occurs pretty much wide, uh, across the whole range of uh, the infusion. Others uh, in, have followed up these studies, and there is some question about whether um, ingesting high doses of amino acids or proteins can uh, blunt the anabolic resistance, but it is quite clear that it is there. And uh, parallel with that, you get a decrease in uh, mTOR signaling in the muscle of uh, the elderly people in response to feeding. Michael also showed that uh, you get this blunting of the anabolic response to exercise across a whole range of exercise intensities at the muscle level. So aging uh, is also associated with the anabolic resistance to the stimulatory effect of exercise. What about the quality? Well, there is a whole plethora of data. I think one of the nicest papers uh, published was from Conley in 2000, where they, in the Journal of Physiology, they showed uh, in groups of young and old volunteers this decline in VO2 max, which is, is uh, well known in a, and is related to the decline in cardiac output with aging. But in the same paper, they also uh, used uh, limb occlusion and then looked at phosphocreatin recovery kinetics in the young and old. And clearly showed a difference in the kinetics in the elderly volunteers, demonstrating uh, the quality of the muscle in the elderly, as well as being lower, was actually uh, 
impaired. Moving on to um, insulin resistance. So this is whole body uh, insulin resistance in a classic study by Fink where they looked at uh, non-elderly and elderly volunteers across a variety of uh, rates of insulin infusion. And you can see that there's clearly insulin resistance across, right across the range. Um, people have said this is attributable to uh, the decline in muscle mass with age. That is indeed uh, a contributing factor. But when you uh, take elderly individuals who are lean and obese but have a similar muscle mass, so in this study uh, we published uh, earlier this year, we have lean and obese volunteers. You see lean mass is actually similar between the two groups. If anything, trunk mass is, is greater, but obviously fat mass is a lot greater. Even under those conditions, uh, you see clear uh, impaired glucose disposal, both at a whole body and what, what I've demonstrated here is at the leg level where the difference is actually greatest. So this is glucose disposal in the final 30 minutes. And this is paralleled by a lower uh, respiratory exchange ratio. So even if you normalize for muscle mass uh, in obese elderly, uh, you cannot uh, correct for this impaired glucose disposal, suggesting this isn't an aging factor. It could be a number of factors, which I'll allude to as I move on. Um, there's been a lot of debate around inflammation being a driver of the loss of muscle mass uh, with aging and also the development of insulin resistance. Uh, with aging. Um, firstly, I'd like to point out that most of the recent studies don't actually show a lower muscle mass in the obese elderly. And indeed, we were able to confirm that. You do see uh, systemic inflammation, as I indicate here from, from the, in this paper, in the, uh, the, elite, the, the lean and obese individuals in the fasted and uh, fed Sorry, oh, this is the wrong slide. Where's it gone? Here you see um, the lean and obese plasma TNF alpha uh, in uh, the fasted state and plasma IL6. There clearly is uh, a greater concentration in the obese, but what we weren't able to show is there was any evidence of muscle inflammation in these individuals. So just because you have a systemic inflammatory response does not mean there's an inflammatory insult at the muscle. And we know this is real because if you then take individuals and you infuse endotoxin into these individuals, you do see a clear muscle inflammatory response and the suppression of muscle protein synthesis. I'd also like to say um, that in the obese individuals, we do see this uh, suppression of muscle protein synthesis to um, feeding. And also, there is a relationship between the lipid content of the muscle, as Francis showed yesterday, there's a relationship between the lipid content in the muscle and the decline in FSR. So again, this points to it, the perturbation of metabolism, potentially not being an aging phenomenon, but being another factor, an environmental factor. So this leads me to the question I'll try to address in the rest of the time I have. Is age-related musculoskeletal deterioration as much a function of inactivity than aging per se? And is it exacerbated in chronic disease? Well, we saw in Mark's slide the government uh, physical acti activity guidelines from the US. It's not really any different in the UK. What we do know in Europe is that at least 50% of people are not meeting these guidelines and therefore it is possible that what we consider to be aging at the moment and age-related 
disease progression is actually inactivity related. Uh, Jason uh, referred to this paper. It's impressive because um, although it's a meta-analysis, it relates to one million people. Um, and the conclusion of the paper was that <coughs> 60 to 70 minutes of exercise per, per day can actually uh, eliminate, that's a strong word, the increased risk of death associated with sitting, but it didn't uh, attenuate the TV, uh, the, the risk associated with TV watching, which I think this study will hopefully convince referees that this is an important point and actually get them to support mechanistic studies in this area. Um, Stephen Blair's done a huge amount of work in the drivers of this phenomenon and, and the, the associated uh, variables that contribute to the risk of mortality. And uh, here he shows um, low cardiorespiratory fitness uh, in both men and women in huge cohorts is, are by far the, uh, is by far the highest risk factor. It actually is greater than the sum of several other risk factors that we all consider to be major drivers of rates of mortality. Looking at disease, um, it's quite clear in a number of chronic non-communicable diseases that inactivity seems to be associated with risk of mortality or risk of exacerbation, and I'll just show some of that data. So here you see uh, in COPD, diabetes, uh, the, the relative risk, or sorry, the step count with 5,000 being an accepted uh, level below which individuals can be defined as sedentary. The two classic papers, uh, one in thorax in 2006 and another in chest in 2011, looked at the rate of admission in COPD and risk of mortality in COPD and showed a clear association between very low, low, moderate and high levels of physical activity. And if you look at the 2011 paper, this is the probability of survival uh, following exacerbation, and this is months of follow-up in COPD patients. Those that were very inactive clearly had a uh, poorer probability or a poorer chance of survival. So chronic disease, physical activity is very important. Uh, again, I'm not sure this is appreciated by uh, reviewers of grants, uh, but it is an important issue. So in the time left, uh, I really want to focus on immobilization because I think immobilization is the most extreme model of inactivity, but it allows you to study mechanisms that is much more, that are much, is much more difficult to achieve in people uh, who are not in the laboratory. So I would put to you that many of the physiological features of aging appear to be also major features of inactivity in young people. And you can make a young person physiologically age, whatever that means, simply by making them more inactive. And, I, and I'll show you some of the data in this area. So this is a paper of ours <coughs> from 2004. This is a total uh, limb cast uh, showing within two weeks of immobilization, you get about a 5% loss of lean mass, and this is parallel with a much greater loss of strength in healthy young volunteers. Uh, Marco Nerici and Mike Rennie demonstrated uh, if you look at the, if you uh, immobilize young individuals, this is the the change in muscle myofibrillar protein synthesis rate at zero, oh, sorry, at 10 and 20 days. And clearly there's a major decline in the first 10 days of immobilization. And in this paper, which is, is, is very nice, they could actually predict from the decline in FSR the loss of muscle mass that they measured using uh, MRI. 
So clearly, th these are young people. So it begs the question, how much of the sarcopenia is actually attributable to individuals being more inactive as they age? Another interesting uh, finding that I'll just mention is that in this paper, uh, they were able, they didn't show the data, but they made a, what I thought was quite a profound statement that there was no evidence of, oh, pardon me, there was no evidence of uh, a change in anabolic signaling in the muscle. So you've got a loss of muscle mass without any change in mTOR signaling pathways. And it, I think we're still in a situation at the moment, we have really no idea why muscle protein synthesis has declined at, at a mechanistic level. Uh, Stu Phillips and Mike followed this up. Um, I showed you earlier anabolic resistance associated with aging. Uh, what they showed was you can get the same anabolic resistance if you mobilize young people and you look at the protein synthetic response uh, in the immobilized and non-immobilized legs uh, in response to low dose and high dose feeding. So anabolic resistance is clearly associated with uh, immobilization. Lee Breen and Stu Phillips also showed if you take elderly people and you reduce their step count, uh, in the postprandial state, you get a decline in muscle protein synthesis. Another important point to make, which people, include myself, made this error, is there's little point in measuring protein synthesis uh, in the fasted state, because it's already low. Why would it fall uh, any lower? So produce physiological stress with feeding or exercise, and you will usually see these uh, physiological perturbations manifest. This is the first um, paper I could find uh, where the researchers actually measured whole body uh, glucose disposal and uh, glucose disposal across the leg. So it, it's, it's a very impressive paper. And uh, what the authors showed is they had various uh, steady state insulin concentrations in control volunteers and volunteers uh, during bed rest, again, young volunteers. And you see um, the uh, difference in uh, glucose disposal manifests itself at a whole body level at about 35 uh, milliunits per liter of insulin concentration. When they looked across the leg, so focusing on skeletal muscle, they were able to see the manifestations right across the range, um, which again demonstrates to me at least that um, it's the muscle that is not contracting and it is the muscle uh, that actually is most susceptible to these variations in, in activity. Uh, out of, also out of uh, Copenhagen, uh, again, bed rest studies, they, Sonne were able to show uh, these are the individual responses, clear changes or clear development of insulin resistance following bed rest. In Nottingham, uh, we've developed a model which allows us to look at uh, forearm glucose uptake in healthy young individuals. Um, the beauty of this model is that it allows you to use the other arm as the control. So you have a within volunteer control making uh, experimental uh, insight, I think, a lot more clearer. So we've used this model in a number of studies, which I'll show you. So this is from Sarah Skiro's thesis. So what you have here is the non oh, pardon me. What you have here is the non immobilized arm and the immobilized arm pre immobilization. And after, um, I think this was three weeks of mobilization, you see forearm glucose uptake in response to oral glucose feeding. So there's a marked reduction in total forearm glucose uptake in the immobilized arm that isn't seen in the contralateral limb. What is amazing 
uh, was the follow-up study where we looked at the time course of this effect, which is part of Ashling Burns' uh, thesis, where we actually see within 24 hours, you see a reduction in forearm glucose uptake, which carries on to 48 hours, and then generally plateaus out. So this is not a slow uh, response. As Mark was alluding to, the inactivity is a physiological stressor, and the muscle responds to this extremely quickly. What is also uh, very interesting is in Sarah's thesis, she had individuals immobilized for three weeks and every three days she took them out of the cast and they performed 50 maximal contractions in bouts of 10. And then they were put back into the cast. And we looked at whether uh, this exercise could rescue the insulin or decrease in forearm glucose uptake that's occurring at one week and three weeks. And what you see here is quite a considerable amount of exercise is unable to rescue this response. So something is happening within a short period to switch off or to, to outweigh the effect of exercise. So inactivity is able to overcome the stimulatory effect of exercise, which is, is quite profound when you think about it. Um, just to say, this is not just a, an immobilization phenomenon. So, again, data out of Copenhagen show that if you reduce step count, you clearly have impaired glucose disposal. Uh, we heard in the... Uh, symposium that Costas Tinzas and um, Francis Stevens organized yesterday that w w what are the mechanisms driving this? And uh, Luke presented, or uh, uh, someone from Luke's group presented data suggesting it wasn't um, lipid accumulation, which may be the case. Um, what I th believe is that actually most of these things manifest when you actually contract the muscle following a period of immobilization because the, the stress is increased upon the muscle. So here you see data from a study we uh, collaborated with, uh, with Fleming Daler and Jorn Helg in Copenhagen. So this is the change in PDC activity. So pyruvate dehydrogenase complex activity. This is the only way carbohydrate can be utilized by the mitochondrion. And with exercise, it's activated, and therefore you get increased pyruvate flux. So here you see the change in PDC activity at the onset of exercise uh, against leg lactate release during that exercise. And you see there's a clear relationship showing that the more activation of PDC, the less lactate release there is. So I, I think, I believe, uh, at least some of this uh, problem rely, rely, resides at the level of PDC regulation, which hopefully we'll look at more. Moving outside of uh, the muscle just briefly, we also know that if you immobilize an individual, you get rapid changes in uh, brain architecture. So this is a paper from 2012 so showing primary motor area and primary sensory areas pre and post uh, immobilization. Where clearly you see volume changes within just a few weeks of immobilization. So this may uh, underpin some of the major loss of uh, strength you see following immobilization, which is much greater than the loss of mass. Where does this bring us? Well, for a long time I've been scratching my head about the total, the, the lack of uh, commonality in aging studies. And so some people see in the LG they lose more muscle mass if you immobilize them. <coughs> so, and others show the opposite. So this is just 
two illustrations from the literature. This is Padden Jones. This is if you in, put someone in bed who's young, and this is the loss of lean mass, and this is a healthy elderly person. Uh, 10 days of inactivity, three days hospitalization. You see far greater mass losses compared to the young. So you then cross the Atlantic to Copenhagen, and you see Charlotte Souter's work where there's less muscle mass loss in the old, sorry, in the old compared to the young. So this begs the question, how much of these responses are actually due to the habitual physical activity levels of the volunteers? And it's maybe not by chance that uh, I flagged this paper, given that uh, the Copenhagen population are known to ride everywhere on bikes. Um, but it does raise the question about how do you control for age-related studies? I think some of the strongest evidence is just shown in pictures. Here's uh, mid-thigh MRI for a 40-year-old triathlete, a 74-year-old sedentary person, and a 74-year-old triathlete. Quite clearly, uh, exercise is having some role to play here. Just my last two slides. So where are the knowledge gaps? Where do we need to try and uh, take our research? Well, at the moment, we do not know the relative contribution of inactivity to metabolic dysreg dysregulation with age uh, or chronic disease. Added to that, we don't know whether the putative drivers of metabolic dysregulation, like physical activity, like adiposity, like age, whether these effects are additive. And this requires sophisticated experimental designs to, to pull this apart. And my last slide really is quite amazing because it's finishing with the same, the exact same message that, that Mark had, and, that, and we haven't discussed this, so that's, that's good. Um, th this is where uh, my thoughts are at the moment. So if we look at, if we look at this paradigm of muscle insulin sensitivity, muscle strength, muscle protein synthesis, you could go on and on. And we look at physical activity levels low to high. Most people believe this is the scenario that exists. So with increased activity, you will get adaptation, and this will take weeks to months. With decreased activity, uh, there's very little change. But actually what is happening is that decreased activity, as Mark said, is a major physiological stress. We just don't realize it yet, and we haven't applied the tools, the experimental tools that we've used in this situation, in this situation. And what's even more profound is that this occurs in days to hours, whereas this generally takes a lot longer. So in, in that point, I'd like to uh, finish and just uh, again thank Janet and Carolyn for the invitation. <laughs>